So uh, I'll kick off now. I'm Helen Tinsley. I'm in charge of activities for RAS Hong Kong. We're delighted we've got a great attendance and I know that there's other people from um, internationally are joining us, including uh, friends of Hong Kong uh, based in UK. Um, this is again, a, a, we, we've been doing a series of Zoom talks and they are very well received. So um, we are delighted today to welcome Nick. Nick is based in Hong Kong. He's um, started life in the Isle of Man and then uh, trained as an accountant, ended up in Hong Kong. He's been here nearly 40 years and he's now turned to, to photography. So he's um, his, his great passion. So he's living and uh, um, uh, he's doing, based in the greater uh, Bay Area, but he's got, um, he's worked overseas in, um, uh, in his accounting role, but now he's uh, increasingly photographing um, places of interest to him. And one of the things he's done is uh, produce this beautiful book called Trading Places and with photographs of the treaty ports we linked to, um, uh, link to Hong Kong. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Nick and I'm sure that you're going to enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Nick. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Uh, nice, to, nice to be with you. Uh, a brief comment. I, th these slides are prepared on a, on a 16 to 9 format, so we're not quite sure um, whether if you have a smaller screen than that, whether it will squash things up or not, but hopefully not. Anyway, today um, I'm going to talk about Trading Places, the book, and not so much um, concentrating on treaty ports, but more on the project that I undertook with a very good friend of mine and, and a former president of the RASHK, Robert Neild. And so we're talking, I'll be talking about our project, which has resulted in three books, two from Robert and, and one, of course, this one from, from, from me. I'm going to split it into three parts. Part one is really to talk about how I became interested in the treaty ports and how our project began. Part two will cover our actual visits. And part three, I've, I've chosen a few buildings and, and um, hopefully I'll have enough time to cover all, all, all of them. Uh, but the reason I've chosen these is, is more because of the restorations that have been, been done by them on the mainland. So that's, um, that's the outline of the talk. So part one, how it began. Well, two words, it began very simply. Um, I, November 1996, I was back on an annual visit to the Isle of Man and um, I, I was having supper with my father and, and I mentioned that two weeks after I was, two weeks after I was due to return to, to Hong Kong, I would be visiting Tianjin for the first time with, with a client. And of course I knew that my father had been born in Tianjin, but that, at that stage was pretty much all I knew. And, and we talked briefly about um, his time in Tianjin. He was actually only five, just barely five when they left and the family was moved to, to Hankow. And um, suddenly he, he said to me, uh, wouldn't it, gosh, his words were exact words, I've written them down. I, th I thought I was gonna remember them, I normally do, but gosh, wouldn't it be a laugh if you found our old house on your trip to Tianjin? And he had reasonably close to hand, he had his, his old a copy of his birth certificate. And he drew, which bear in mind that he was only five when he was last in Tianjin, he drew this sketch which described where the house was. And it was on Racecourse Road at a point where two other roads joined in a V formation. And in the middle, the uh, <laughs> Americans had had a military base there, of army barracks. And so armed with this information, uh, oh, and one other important point he, he, he mentioned was that the house was entered by its front door, not on the front of the house, but up some steps on the left-hand side. And that actually proved very critical information. So two weeks later, I was back in Hong Kong and, and uh, off we went to Tianjin uh, with my client. 
we were working during the day, but we went out to the client's premises along Racecourse Road, both to and from the, the uh, client's premises. And um, there were a couple of places that looked interesting or, or could be the point. There, were, there seemed to be uh, a location where the two roads joined in a V. Um, but I was unsure, and of course we were in a car, so we were moving uh, quite fast or reasonably fast. And so after our a formal dinner that night, I should say after rather too many Mao ties as it turned out, I and a, a colleague jumped into a taxi to go out to this spot where we thought the house could be. And we arrived, in fact, Hopefully you can see my pointer. We arrived and got out of the taxi right just before this this crossing and walked along the road and walked into this gate and sure enough there was a front door or the main door the main entrance was up a series of steps on the left of the house and looking back across the road there was this V formation. Fortunately, uh, so we were fairly sure we'd found the house, but to, to, to kill things off completely, it, someone came out of the house and uh, um, my colleague was Mandarin speaker and, and the gentleman who came out of the house confirmed that Americans had had their barracks across the road because his mother used to work there. And so early the next morning, because it was now dark, uh, uh, early the next morning, I got back in a, into a taxi and, and zipped out before we departed and, and took a photograph and posted this to my father, who in due course confirmed that I found the house. So that, that was cause for celebration on its own. But of course, um, my father had other plans because he said, right, well, now that you've found the house, how about trying to find the country club? Because I remember going to the country club a lot when I was young. I was seldom allowed inside, but uh, I was able to enjoy the outdoor facilities. And this photograph is from about 1930, and somewhere in there uh, is my father on his skates. Now, notice the two turrets here, because that's quite relevant later. Um, so, at the same time, it actually was in December, almost identically one year from, from the previous visit, I was with the same client. And by now, the client himself had become increasingly interested in my quest for finding buildings related to my family. So we managed to finish work quite early one day. And um, uh, I asked the concierge in the hotel whether he thought he had a driver that would know where this building was and he he did so we hired the driver and we drove out to the building and sure enough on the 4th of December 1997 to be precise it was definitely the clubhouse building and okay before I mentioned the turrets well there there was one at this end and there was one at the other end now they were missing but that didn't worry me because it was clearly that the, the, the building we sought. The reason they were missing is because in 1976, Tangshan, a city not that far away from Tianjin, had a massive earthquake that virtually leveled the entire city. And that's no exaggeration. And Tianjin, although some distance from the epicenter, was, didn't escape damage. And amongst the things that were damaged were, were these towers. Uh, and so the authorities at the time just decided to to remove the towers and, and because they, they, they really serve little purpose, more of a design feature than anything else. And uh, so success again. And thereafter, um, I was able to visit Tianjin on two other occasions. Once I came back to the club and I attended a, a Friday afternoon tea dance and the club was actually closed off except for this top floor here which was the main dining area and it also had uh, um, a dance floor which was actually the first sprung dance floor to be imported into China and the tea dance took place here. I tried to poke around downstairs but I, but I 
you know, I had no torch and the lights were off and it was really dirty. It was clear that only the dining room was, was still in use. I also tried to find the race course. Um, and this, although I was, here's the, here's the country club area. This is the building I've, we've just been looking at. But I was able to trace where the race course was. Now, obviously this wasn't a water feature that the horses had to swim through, but Tianjin was, was and still to a certain extent, is very vulnerable to flooding. And so they've obviously subsequently built these lakes to some sort of um, management, water management project. But the race course in its early days also had this in canal going around its inside, which was there for drainage uh, and um, so I, unfortunately there was no remains of the, the grandstand that was there. There was no obvious remains of the race course itself, of course, but it was clear, it is clearly visible uh, using Google Earth. So after this, by now towards the end of 1997, I thought it was about time that I started reading up on, on treaty ports and, um, I did that and, and I started talking to my friend Robert about it and he, he was already very much interested in the treaty port era uh, and so, so we were able to compare notes and we started to plan something perhaps one day we could look into the treaty ports, visit them and so on. Now my second visit to after all these finds was actually to take my father back to Tianjin in November 2004 and one of the things we did obviously we visited the house I'll come back to that shortly but we also visited the country club now it was in then it was completely closed because it had closed down for the SARS um, problem in, in 2003 and it had never really reopened but we, we went in and, and there was a caretaker there and once she understood that my father's parents had been members of the club and he himself had played in the grounds as a, as a youth, she grabbed a huge set of keys from, from behind her and she gave us a guided tour around the whole club. And it really was amazing. Now, as I've said, the, the dining room was the only area that was actively being used. But we went everywhere uh, and there was a, um, a small theatre that was covered in dust, and, but the curtains were still hanging. We went downstairs where there was a, a bowling alley. Again, it was dirty and, and you, you couldn't really make out much because the place, many of the rooms were being used as a storage, for storage of old furniture and everything. But the, the billiards rooms were still marked as such. It still had billiards room on, on, on the door and the tables were still there. They were covered in, in they had covers on but which themselves were covered in dust and other debris uh, and then the, the indoor swimming pool again it was empty of water but full of furniture and stuff and it was really just a concrete mess but um it, it was fascinating to see it was just unbelievable it was almost like a time warp albeit the place had deteriorated somewhat but it was pretty much unchanged from what it had been in the 1930s and then we went back to the house and um, very conveniently uh, the, the house, the downstairs had been opened up as a bar. And so this is one morning, but one evening we were there and my father, you know, we went into the bar at six o'clock and had our gin and tonics in his old dining room and, and living room. And it was quite a moving experience, especially for him, as you can imagine. I mean, he hadn't been there for 75 years. Um, his only comment to me, though, was while he was looking around, he said, oh, it, it seems a bit smaller than what I remember it. And I said, well, pa, maybe I can answer that on behalf of the house and say that you're just a little bit bigger than what the house remembers you as so there's bound to be a change of perspective but it, it was a wonderful trip and this time we we spent some time looking around the old city center and it really struck me that there was a huge number of old 
Western style buildings. Uh, and of course, like when I got back to, to Hong Kong, I, once more, I, I spoke to Robert and I said, look, we really must do something about these treaty ports. It, it's, there's, if Tianjin is a typical example, it, it's, there's a lot to be seen. And so fast forward, um, at the end of 2006, I, I decided that time had come, although I was still quite young, I wanted to, to retire from the accounting profession and, uh, and concentrate on photography. And I, I gave my one year's notice. And just before, I think it was November, what it was, November 2007, i.e. a few weeks before I would leave the firm on the 31st of December, I, I suggested to Robert that we go up to Tianjin and I'd show him the old family homestead and so on and, and we'd have a good look around the city because there's obviously a lot there. And of course we, we decided to stay in, in the Astor Hotel that we'd read a lot about. And this was how the, the Astor Hotel looked. Um, back then in 2007. A lot of its old original brickworks and everything's all been covered over in, in slabs of marble, or well, not even marble, but massive tiles and everything. But inside it, it had retained its old charm, particularly the old staircases. And we both had rooms on the, on the, you know, on the front facing out. Um, uh, but, we looked around the old city center. We went out, of course, to the club, which was by then completely closed, so we couldn't even get in there at all. And we visited the house, um, which by then, unfortunately, was no longer a bar, but was, had some commercial business in, in the ground floor. Um, and, but at the end of the, the, our trip, we were there for three days, we, we decided that we, right, now we must do something. We're not quite sure what, but we would do something about exploring these treaty ports. Now, as fate would have it, coincidentally, um, two or three weeks later, Robert um, who was, was asked whether he'd be interested in um, writing a book on the first five treaty ports, which was to be a part of a series um, um, being produced by uh, joint publishing and it was going to be an illustrated book and of course he jumped at that and as it was an illustrated book he was going to need photographs thankfully to, to, to illustrate the book with. So not only was the timing perfect but we'd already and we'd already decided that we want to do something but right through comes straight on our desk is a project that we can both enjoy doing together. And so that's how it started in 2008. Um, we, I, I, we, our first joint trip was actually in September 2008, and that was to Qingdao, which of course is not one of the, the first treaty ports, but we were attending um, a, um, a conference in Weihai, and so on, on the Chinese labor court, in fact. And so we thought we'd pop into Qingdao, which was a great experience. And that, that was our first joint venture. And that's how, that's where we first started. But prior to that, I'd also done a trip to Shanghai just to have a look and basically to try out my new camera kit. And also, I'd also been down to Guangzhou too. So our first trip was in September, 2008. And that was the beginning of the visits. And um, again, in two words, terrific fun. Obviously they were educational, but we, we had a really good time and I cannot underestimate, understate that. We had a really good time. Now, to talk about how we approached our trips, uh, we both did our own research. Robert was far more knowledgeable than I was at this stage uh, and um, well, even today, in fact, but, but that's beside the point. Uh, and he had a lot more, lot more resources than I did, he, particularly on the maps. 
but but I, I wanted to learn and I did my own research and he sent over maps that would be of interest and this is a map from 1910 of Qingdao and you can probably you may be able to see but it, it's numbered and so so th there's actually a key and it, it, there's a each numbers represent buildings so it was a great help for our planning purposes uh, to Qingdao so but this is the approach we we did with all of our visits we spent a lot of time individually and then we'd come together and compare our notes and probably the most useful thing we did was to about a day or two days before we uh, were due to visit a place we would go on to google earth and start looking and comparing what's on google earth to what the old maps have now normally um I would say that we would look out for red roofs. Of course, Qingdao being full of old houses is full of red roofs. So it wasn't a huge amount of help, but this is just an example. Um, and the other reason I'm showing you this is, uh, this is a much later uh, map from Google Earth, um, much later flyover, as it were. And it's much higher resolution. The, the, the Google Earth resolution now is absolutely fantastic. In, in the early, in the days when we were doing our initial research, if you remember the, the Google Earth thing I showed of the, of the race course, it wasn't nearly as clear as this. But um, you'll see, you'll notice obviously that the, there are buildings that have been marked. Now this particular um, screenshot is, is uh, from my own um, Google Earth layer that I've prepared. I'm, I'm very keen that people who buy the book can find these buildings if they so want to in the flesh. And so many, there are a lot of books of photographs in the past, but no, it's very hard to know how to find them. So for every building in the book, uh, I've, uh, I've marked on a Google Earth layer. And if for those that have the book, there's a QR code on the inside flap at the rear. Now, if you use that QR code, you'll be taken to a Dropbox, which you can then enter uh, and download the layer. It it, unfortunately, it has to be Google Earth, because for reasons best known to Google, Google Maps, which is much easier to, to you know, um, get hold of, because you can get, get it on, online. Google Maps, I don't know why, but that they are skewed by several minutes, but on both axes. So it, I can't mark a house according to the GPS coordinates because it will show up in the wrong place on, on Google Maps. So Google Earth is the only way I could go with that. So and and there is, as you may have noticed, there's white dots in the middle. Those are the ones that are in the book. I've also added a few extra buildings of interest like for example the British consulate which are not in the book unfortunately we had didn't really know where that was and then when we did it was so heavily surrounded by trees that it was impossible to photograph and there's another one here the Soares residence and also Karlowitz which was a big German business so that's um, available and I hope people will use it Okay, our approach, once we got on site, we would aim to start around, well, have an early breakfast and be out the door at least by nine o'clock. Over breakfast, we would discuss the objectives and also the routes we were gonna do for that day. Robert would always uh, produce huge number of printouts of maps um, from, from Google Maps um, and, um, we, we, he'd stuck, stick them together and, and we'd use those to plan our routes. We would continue throughout the day, um, but we'd try to get back to the hotel by about six. The photography, you know, there was no question of hanging around for, for perfect lighting conditions or anything. I simply had to make use of what light there was. Occasionally I might go out early um, when there was a, a building that I particularly wanted to record in, in decent light but generally speaking uh, I just dealt with whatever 
light that was available, whether it's the middle of the day and bright or whether it was raining or whatever it was. Um, initially, in my keenness as a new photographer, I used a tripod and also a tilt and shift lens, but that we stopped using that is it, it slowed us down far too much. Um, I always took a tripod though. Uh, it was normally left in the hotel room, but occasionally I would take it out for, for when I knew I'd have a reason I wanted to use it for. Tilt and shift lens didn't really become necessary because most of the buildings from, from the Treaty Port here are, are relatively small. And so most of my shots were, were done on 24 to 105 lens and I took along a, a wide angle 16 to 35 just in case but I try not to use that too often as it tends to uh, distort buildings on the edges. All on foot, walking is the only way to, to deal with this. If you try and get in a car and drive around you're just going to miss a lot of things. But we did use a car uh, occasionally to, to um, reach distant places um, which were just too far away. For example, in Fuzhou, the, 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 the main anchorage of Pagoda Island is, is a long way out of the city. We often would go use one city as a base to visit other treaty ports. In Hankow, we went twice and, and the second time we used that as a base and then got the train up to, to um, Yichang and then down to Jiujiang on another occasion. And the, the great thing is, though, is that wherever we went, we, we were always welcomed. We were often created quite a lot of interest and also occasionally quite a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I've got lots of stories I could tell about that, but I'll, I'll just mention one. It was once when we had a, a driver, um, <clears throat> excuse me, who, who we were going to need for two days. We... Um, the second day he turned up with his own camera and he, he was getting into these buildings uh, big time. Of course, once we visited a city, um, that was not the end, uh, apart from processing images. We had to, I wanted to spend, I spent a lot of time reconfirming that we'd, we'd correctly identified buildings and this led to more research and um, inevitably, because I needed more photographs. I often went off uh, to, on return visits, particularly to the, the um, bigger cities such as Shanghai and Qingdao, and of course, Tianjin, which is a, naturally a favorite of mine. I also, um, during this time, gained a lot of um, knowledge, which I hadn't had of, of my family's activities in China. Um, I'll come to touch on those very briefly, shortly. But I mentioned we'd try to be back by six o'clock and, and thereafter we had a bit of rest and recreation. But there was one important formality to, to take care of before we, we went off to get something to eat and then have an early night and start again. And that, that was to try and estimate how many steps we'd covered that day. And I, I, in those days I had a, a small step counter that attached to the, my, my belt. And we, we'd have a bit of fun trying to estimate how, how, how many steps. Normally we underestimated, but that's how I know exactly that we did 2,784,010 steps in this whole project. Or I should say at least I did that, that amount because of course sometimes I went back on my own. Okay, I'm going to mention this building um, and mention the family very briefly because if, if I uh, start talking about my family's activities in China, we'll, we'll be here till Christmas and I'm talking about Christmas 2021, not this year. So I'll just touch on this. It's a bit of a strange photograph because it looks as if I've shrunk. I'm sure I didn't, but it's just the, the, the nature of the building. Uh, this is the British Consulate Office in, and Residence in Wuhu. This is a very important building to my, to my family. Um, the first member of our family arrived in China in 1867. He, William, uh, correction, uh, Colin Mackenzie Ford, who we generally refer to as Colin the Consul. Um, he'd been born in in India and he'd been sent to be educated in Aberdeen and 
he ended up in Aberdeen University, which happened to be a recruiting ground for, for the British consular service in China. And so instead of going back to join his older, older brother, my great-great-grandfather in, in, in the British, in the India civil service, he found himself in China in 1867 and he raised, went up through the ranks and he was appointed consul in Wuhu. Now I won't go into any more details, but suffice to say that as a result of his appointment to this consular post, um, various things happened that led to the marriage of my father's parents in Yu Chuang in 1921. So I will now leave my family alone, but we hopefully, if I've got time, we'll, we'll come across Colin the Consul a bit later. Part three, buildings and restorations. We'll only need one word for this, and it's stunning. I mean, what China does in, in, in restorations is absolutely wonderful, as I hope I can demonstrate now. Now, you'll remember this is the Astor Hotel, as it was in Tianjin in November 2007. Well, this is what it looks like after a restoration that took place in 2010. I mean, it, it's immaculate. It's beautifully done. It really is. Um, a bit of history on the hotel. It was built in, or first built in 1863 by a, a business-minded missionary with the interesting name of John Innocent. I suppose if you're going to be a missionary, Innocent is as good a name as anything to have. And he decided, he saw an opening, of the, 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 the treaty port was in its early stages and he saw an opening to, to a, there was no hotels or anything obviously. And so he opened up his hotel. Uh, somewhat strangely, in the early days, it was referred to as the Mud House. Um, I don't have a photograph of it. I'm sure it was more than just a mud house. But in 1886, they decided, the shareholders decided to redevelop the site. And um, this is what they built. Now, I'm talking about the tower and the extent of the wooden Parts. This is what was produced in 1886-87. There, there was a further extension in 1925, which is this part here, which doesn't look very big, but it goes quite a long way back. And it um, has had the first elevator or lift. Um, it was an Otis lift, and it was the allegedly the first elevator to be installed in the whole of China. I, I should say that Tianjin and Shanghai were always competing to be the first of this or the first of that. But Tianjin claims that they had the first lift. This larger block behind here was added after 1984. And it, in fact, the hotels now covers the whole block and, and there's offices, there's a, new, there's a new wing of the hotel where there's new, new rooms. But of course, whenever we went to Tianjin, we always asked to stay in one of the old rooms. And, and the, the main entrance of the hotel, which used to be down here, is now on, on the other side of the building. Uh, and it's a much bigger, much, much bigger entrance, as you would expect from a hotel of this size. There's a rather a sad personal story, though, is that a British man called William O'Hara who in 1903 became the largest shareholder in the company that was running the hotel. And uh, he became director and general manager, not until 1916, although he was the largest shareholder, one of his friends was looking after things, so he, he left it until 1916. He, of course, was there in 1925 and was responsible for the, the, that first extension that I've just described down the end there. Um, come 1941 and Pearl Harbor, um, he was still in, in Tianjin and eventually ended up interned along with many others um, from Tianjin. He, he was in the Waisin camp and um, uh, he survived uh, and released in 1945. He came back to Tianjin and like most of the expatriates that 
emerged from, from the various internment camps, they all thought that business would just go back to normal. Okay, they all knew that the treaty ports had been surrendered by the British and the Americans and others in January 1943 as a, as a show of support to their, their ally in the war against Japan, China. But other treaty ports had been surrendered in the past and things had carried on as normal. And so William O'Hara started to rebuild his business. And, and of course, he hadn't counted on the, the Civil War. And Tianjin was captured fairly early on by, by the Communist Party. And in around 1950, the new local government presented him with a huge bill for back taxes and rent and everything going back to the first day of the, the, the when the hotel was built because they never recognized these treaties. So of course this um, was something he obviously couldn't pay and so he handed over the, the property to the, uh, the city authorities. He received a total of 8,860 renminbi in compensation and he went away heartbroken to, to New Zealand and not only heartbroken but virtually penniless where, where he died soon afterwards. But the nice thing about that story was that um, when, when the ho this hotel was restored in 2010, the, the main hotel bar was named O'Hara in, in his memory, which is kind of a nice way to end, although of course he wouldn't have known anything about it. And I've talked about the country club. Um, this is after a restoration in 2014. They didn't put the towers back, I see. This here is the main entrance. And I'm going to move fairly quickly. Here, here is the main entrance. I mentioned the, um, the floods. There was a very bad flood in 1940, uh, correction, 1939. And this plaque marks the high water mark of that flood. So you can just, uh, of course, I know China's suffering floods in other cities at the moment, but it's obviously a problem. And this is the main staircase. And, and I don't know how much you can see on your computers, but the restoration is simply wonderful. I mean, you can't do better than that. That's the original floor. Um, and, and the detail in the paneling, the detail here in the carvings, these are almost certainly the original woodwork. Uh, and, but it's been so beautifully done. And I was given another tour, and of course, this is now the swimming pool restored back to its former glory. I also visited the, the bowling alley uh, and in 2014 and it really is impressive what they've done to this building. Moving down to, to Shanghai, I'm not going to talk about individual buildings in Shanghai, I'm going to talk about the concept that they've applied here in, in, in doing up the Bund. When we, Robert and I first visited in 2008, the Bund was basically a, a giant road with four or five lanes going in one direction and four or five lanes going in the other. There was a walkway, a, a, some of degree of walkway along the Bund. But um, when I returned on my own in 2009, <coughs> excuse me, um, there was a great deal of act building activity and, and I could see there was a great deal of tunneling going on and a lot of work was being um, undertaken on all the old buildings along the Bund. And this was in um, with the Shanghai World Expo of 2010. Now, I don't know how they did it, but I, I'm sure they finished everything. But what they did is they, they reduced the road to four lanes coming north to south, which is like this way. And the, the opposite direction went underneath. And it also went underneath the Suzhou Creek at the other end, so that the road was much narrower and much quieter. They also got rid of a very gruesome looking, ugly bridge, concrete bridge, because they no longer needed it as the traffic was now going underneath. And all of these buildings were restored to a very, very high standard indeed. Best of all is that they 
have this elevated walkway which has expanded massively compared to what was there in, in the past and of course you can walk along there you can look at the beautiful buildings you don't see the cars because they're lower down between the walkway and, and the buildings and of course you you can enjoy the river view now of course one wonders whether hong kong could do such a thing but i shan't dwell on on that point but it, it really is tremendous it, it, it's I, I think it's a terrific achievement Moving down south, um, this is the first consulate in Beihai or Pakhoi as it was called. Um, it's rather basic and uh, I can imagine given the date it was officially open that the consul who arrived there thought it may have been a bit of a 1st of April joke, but joke it was not. Um, and he, the consuls, it, it was a very dangerous city to live in anyway because of disease uh, and uh, disease was a great problem and, and to live in these unsanitary conditions uh, was a, a challenge although I suppose he could take comfort from the fact that he had a sea view and, and a personal steps down to his beach but undoubtedly he wouldn't want to do that but it wasn't until 1885 that um, a, cons a, a proper, if you like, appropriate consulate was built in, in Beihai. And this, this isn't a particularly good example of a, a newly renovated building, but the reason I mention this is that in 1999, the city authorities wanted to um, put in a new dual carriageway. And this building happened to be standing right in the middle of where the dual carriageway was going to go. And so rather than just bulldoze it down, they, they lifted up onto a rails and they moved it 55.8 meters out of the way and then put it down again. And it's now sitting in the grounds of a, of a, of a secondary school. But once again, it, it just shows that the determination and that to keep these buildings, or given the history, you could argue that if they bulldoze them all down, they could hardly be blamed. But no, they've kept these buildings and by and large, they've restored them to a very high standard. And the last one I want to talk about um, <clears throat> is the British Consul's residence in Gulangyu, Xiamen. Now, Xiamen was one of the first five treaty ports. And so that's reflected in the date that this building was, was built, which is 1848. Now the consul, um, m most, Xiamen was, was not a healthy place. It probably wasn't as bad as, as Beihai was in those days, but it was still fairly unhealthy. But what tended to happen is that the concession area was on, on the main island of Xiamen, but people started to move over to live with their residences on, on the small island of Gulangyu. And, um, and, and, the, and eventually some of the consulate offices moved over as well. The British, first British consul here, he, he blew his budget big time with this building. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a big building. And moreover, it actually had a second, it had a, a second story, which was made of wood. And um, no sooner had they probably cleared away the, the, the debris and the, and the, the champagne bottles and the glasses from, from the housewarming party, then a huge typhoon came through and basically blew the top floor off and into small bits. Prudently, the, the British consul, having already overstepped his budget, he decided to make do with a single story building, which I can assure you is plenty big enough. Now, when Robert and I had first visited Gulangyu, um, we couldn't we could see a corner of the colonnade, but we couldn't get in to the grounds. The, the, the guard on duty, uh, sorry, sorry, governor, no chance, more than my job's worth sort of thing. And we couldn't get in, understandable. But I went back later uh, and um, <clears throat> it was still locked. But I, on a whim, I, I went into the administrative, uh, the Gulang Yu administrative offices, which, quite appropriately, we're in, we're in the former British consulate office as well. And I asked if I could see 
the director in charge. Now, that's a bit, a bit rude walking in with no appointments or anything. Now, my, my Colin, the consul who I've mentioned before, spent one year here. And uh, to his credit, the director agreed to see me. And rather than go on about how my great, great, great uncle spent one year as British consul here, I, I simplified it to say my great grandfather spent a year here and would, would it be possible for me to go and look at this building because you know the family would love to see photographs of the building. Ah, once again to his credit he agreed and um, he whistled up his official translator and one of his historians and we all came out to see the building and I was really pleased. Now I had a bit of good luck in that I think because at that time they were um, uh, about to apply for world heritage status for the whole of Gulang, New Island. Uh, and so he probably thought, you know, he'd need to be flexible in the future. So he was certainly very kind and flexible with me. By way of payback, uh, I gave them copies of all my photographs. I also dug out quite a lot of research material and, and sent that to them and also some, some old photographs of the building when it's in, in its original form. Now the island has uh, achieved the World Heritage Site status and I would put my money on, the, on that they will have restored this um, building back to how it was. Or I'd be pretty sure they would have you know, re reinstated the colonnades rather than having them all windowed off and being used for for whatever use they had. So that brings me to the end. Wow, eight, 6.50, bang on time. I fear I may have rushed things a little bit at some point. What can we expect from you next? Oh, um, pictures are very good, yeah. what can you expect from me next? Very well, I'm actually per speaking personally. Uh, well, Robert and I have actually thought about doing a book because we kept a lot of notes on our trips and we thought about perhaps doing something jointly to, to record our, our, our journey. But I, I think having thought that through, although it was a very good idea of a mutual friend of ours, it's probably a little bit limited to entertaining ourselves rather than anyone else. But what I've also been doing, part, part of the reason that was, this has taken me a bit longer to get the book out is because I've been working on other things. I've got other books out on Hong Kong's declared monuments because I want to try and cover all of those. And there's, um, I did two sessions with for the Tumwa group of hospitals and, 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 and they kindly, well, I, 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 I presented them with an Apple book that I organized myself, which they republished. And, and the second session I did for them, which uh, the first was on the Tumwa Museum, the second was on one of the temples, uh, uh, one of the temples they look after that I didn't have to do anything other than take the photographs for that because they then arranged the, the, you know, the design and everything. But I also did um, a book of photo, an Apple book of photographs of King, King Ying Lei just soon after it was restored. Um, and uh, in those days, Carrie Lamb was in charge of the, the Development Bureau and, and I gave her a copy of the book, which I'd kind of really done for, for the heritage people. Uh, and, but then the Development Bureau republished the book and it, it's, it's, a, it's available as a giveaway and you can actually download it. But I, I really want to contribute to the Hong Kong bit side as well, because of course Hong Kong has been very kind to me. I mean, I was able to retire at the age of 53, for goodness sake, so, and to concentrate on my passion. So I, I am keen to um, finish my, off my declared monuments project fairly soon. I wouldn't mind a bit of a rest, frankly, after this book. But, uh, there you go. Right. Okay. Uh, next question. Do you have a favorite building or city? Oh, favorite city is easy. Tianjin has to be. It, the great thing about, I mean, I'm biased because my father was born there, but the great thing about Tianjin is it's a big city, but 
all of the, the buildings are, are com in a relatively small area. Okay, the, the country club is a little way out, but there were, I think, nine. It was by far the largest um, number of countries represented in, in Tianjin. And so it's fascinating. You can go, you can walk between the different styles of the buildings, the British part, then you move into the French part, then you cross the river into the Italian and then the Austro-Hungarian. And even the Russians were there as well. Um, the only one that didn't really do anything with their concession area was Belgium. And that was it was badly sighted anyway. But Tingin's my favorite. Buildings, oh dear, difficult. Um, one of my favorites, I'm afraid I haven't got it here, but one of my favorites is from the city of Tengchong, which is in Yunnan, and it's way down south and to the west, and it was the old British consulate there. And it, it's the last building in the book, uh, and I'll only I mean, I'm not trying to pull one on you to make you buy the book, of course, but it's better described. It's better that you read the, the, what I have there and you'll understand perhaps why it's one of my favorites. But I, I'm really passionate about all of these buildings. I, I really, really am. It's hard to pick on any favorites. Um, I, the Astor Hotel in, in Tingin, of course, that's a favorite because it's been, they've all been done beautifully, but that's particularly well done and the the country club is another one but I, I i like all of these buildings really okay um great uh next question was uh you mentioned your friend robert what is his yeah. full name and robert niels and yeah now i can tell you his books uh he did has done two books the china coast which is on the first five treaty ports, which came out, was published by joint publishing in 2010. Probably difficult to get hold of these days, but by far the best book. And it kind of my, my, my book is uh, um, an unofficial, if you like, pictorial version of Robert's second book, which was published in, in 2015, China's Foreign Places, which goes through, treaty port by treaty port. So what we'd noticed in our research is that every time we wanted to look up, say, Tianjin, for example, we'd have to go through all these books and the indices uh, and then laboriously drag through the, the various entries in the books. And there, there was no one book that you could go to that you could read the history in detail, if you were visiting Shanghai or Tianjin or Wuhu, say Wuhu, if you were visiting Wuhu on business or for whatever reason, it was laborious to try and find out anything about Wuhu, let alone a, a decent amount of the history. So Robert's book, China's Foreign Places, enables any of the reader to pick the city he wants to, he's interested in, and, and to read about the history. And to a certain extent, that's how I've laid out my book. Well, to an exact extent, that's how I've laid out my book, city by city, all grouped into reasonably uh, compatible geographical areas. But um, of course, not by no means anything like the coverage that Robert's book does, because he, he even gets down to, to individual uh, locations of landing rights and things like that. So there's tremendous detail in that book. And that book is should be readily available. It's published by the Hong Kong University Press. So, okay. Our next question is, were the expat communities in these ports very large? Well, they, they ranged. Now, um, well, Shanghai, of course, it was huge. And Tianjin was big. T Tianjin by commercial throughput was probably second. Um, a, his, a, prop, a historian can gun me down probably, but was probably second. Hankow was bigger in terms of trading and manufacturing items but, than Tianjin, but Tianjin had a huge financial uh, community as well. So anyway, th those three cities ha were, had a lot of expatriates in. Now, my, my grandfather was worked in, uh, first in Shanghai, and then he was uh, in Yuchuang, which is now called Yinkao, 
and he spent a bit of time in Yi Chang, uh, and he he went around quite a few of the ports, and he spent a lot of time in Hankow, and and back to Tianjin, uh, and then back to Shanghai before he he retired a little bit early, being a bit worried about what the Japanese were going to do, and which of course they did do in nineteen. He left in 1939, but there were big communities. Now, Wuhu, I've mentioned, uh, Wuhu was not a great success as a, as a treaty port, but, but um, the shipping companies were there, and um, it, it, was a, it was a center for timber and, and rice uh, and so on. And the, the, where there were some of the treaty ports that weren't so big commercially, they were quite often big with the missionaries. And, and Wuhu was a very big location uh, for the missionaries. And, and they set up a number of hospitals and, and schools. Uh, the schools are still in operation to this day. Um, so if there weren't, if the treaty port wasn't big, uh, full of expats who were trading, it was, had normally had quite a lot of missionaries that may have been based there. Uh, great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, last one is about a specific port. Do you have any comment on what can be seen in Guangzhou One in Jiangzhou? That's the old French concession. So how important uh, uh, was that? I don't know who asked yeah. that question. Yeah. Um, is there anything no, to see I, there I haven't been well? there. Robert, Robert did go there. Um, I, I haven't been there. Um, it, 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 there's some buildings still left, but uh, I think from memory, Robert told me that the the buildings that were left over, a lot of them were within military uh, PLA army compounds, and therefore they were difficult to access. And, and based on that, I, I didn't I, I didn't follow up. Um, that, that I think became a French treaty port in, in towards the end of the 19th century. Okay, fantastic, thanks. Uh, okay, I think we can wrap up, um, Helen. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick, the wonderful talk. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other questions, but a, um, yeah, it was, it was fascinating to listen to your journey and see the, the pictures supporting that journey. Uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs> Yeah. Thank, you, Thank you, Nick. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Okay, and, you're uh, welcome. Yeah, have, have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye for now.